We've been working through Colossians, and our reading today is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 18, through to chapter 4, verse 1. You can follow that on the screen, in the service sheets if you've printed them off, or in your Bibles at home. Colossians chapter 3, verse 18. Wives, be submissive to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't become bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord and not for men knowing that you'll receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he has done, and there is no favoritism. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's a passage uh, there, uh, an outline there, sorry, in your service sheet. So you can use the comments box at the bottom of the page uh, to email any questions, feedback or queries that you might have uh, to Neil or me and we'll endeavour to get back to you as soon as we can. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into this passage together. Father, thank you for your word. Uh, Many of us have never visited modern day Turkey, let alone Colossae. But, Father, we get a taste of what it means to be your people there, but more importantly, what it means to be your people everywhere, in every time, in every circumstance, as we read your words written down here. Father, please imprint, apply, and sow these words so deeply into our lives that people will see a magnificent image of the Lord Jesus as they watch us and come to know the goodness of his grace. In his name we pray. Amen. Let the peace of the Messiah control your hearts. Let the word of the Messiah dwell richly among you. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, they're wonderful words, commands, exhortations, aren't they? As I hear them, as I read them, I want to see how they're applied, what they look like in practice. I immediately assume that Paul and Timothy, the authors of this letter to that small group of Christians in Colossae in modern-day Turkey, I immediately assume that Paul and Timothy will show me what this looks like in my life, my life as an individual, as Bernard Stephen Gabbard. Uh, Now, behind such a logical assumption is an understanding about society and who we are, who I am, and what makes up society, the basic building blocks. The understanding lying behind this assumption is very clear. Individuals are the basic building block of society. So show me what it looks like in my life as an individual. So imagine my surprise when I turn to verse 18 and read wives. And then verse 19 and read husbands and so on through to Colossians 4.1. The basic unit that Paul and Timothy address in these succinct, even brief commands is not the individual, is it? It's the individual in community, the individual in relationship. Let me say that again. The individual in community, the individual in relationship. Now, that's a very important observation the first of a number that we'll make before we get into the passage, it's a very important observation to begin with because it transforms the way we view ourselves, the way we view society, the way we analyse so much that is presented to us through the media. Moreover, it shouldn't surprise us as thoughtful readers of God's word. After all, this is how God created humans. Remember that reading from Genesis 1, 26 to 28? to be created in the image of God who is three in one, individual in community. To be created in the image of God is to be created as an individual in community. Moreover, as the image bearers of the creator with an image of the creator that's being restored, we are being restored as God's people to that understanding of ourselves and society and relationship. 
The second observation we need to make is the nature of this section. Uh, as we come to this part of this letter that Paul and Timothy wrote, uh, the language and the structure and the way the words work is very different to what we've looked at over the last few weeks. Just look back at Colossians 3 verse 12, Colossians 3 verse 1 and Colossians 2 16, the passages that we've looked at over the last three weeks, all of them begin with connecting words and not say this passage. It's succinct. It's brief. It's to the point. Bang, bang, bang. It just moves through. Now We need to consciously place a passage like this in its context. That's what we should do with every part of the Bible when we read it. But the absence of those connecting words that we've relied upon so much in the last few weeks shouldn't lull us into considering that this is a passage that exists in a vacuum. These words exist in a context, and that context is the one that I began with, the one I referred to at the start, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 16 and verse 17. I think that Paul and Timothy here are helping us to see what it means to have the peace of the Messiah rule in our hearts. Remember last week we said that this was the restoration of the fullness and the goodness of God's design. I think they're helping us to understand what it means to have the word of the Messiah dwell richly among us. I think they're trying to push us to consider how every part of our lives is to be lived in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every part of our lives, public and private, there is no divide. Every part of our lives reflects on his reputation and interests. These verses are an application of those verses. The next observation emerges from this. Please pay careful attention to the frequency of the Lord language in these commands. There are seven references to the Lord in only nine verses. This is not just a list of commands that leads to moral behaviour or a checklist for being good. These commands are a statement about what it means to walk with Jesus as Lord. Remember Colossians 2 verses 6 to 7, which, and this is the fourth observation, that's why our surprise that their focus is so strong. Uh, in our world, in our time and age, if I was to apply Colossians 3, 15 to 17 and walking with Jesus as Lord, I'd do so either to individuals or communities because that's the way we often think about the basic units of society. But that's not what God does through Paul and Timothy. God exposes his basic unit of society, which is the individual in community, the individual in relationship, and then applies those verses, Colossians 3, 15 to 17, to the individual in community, in relationship. And when you look at the people mentioned here, the roles discussed, they're all individuals in community. A, a woman can't be a wife otherwise, can she? A, a, a man can't be a husband otherwise. A, a child can't be a child, and so on. And the fifth observation flows out of that. There would have been no other community that existed like this at the time this letter was written or since, which is made up of such a diverse group of individuals. Here is Colossians 3 verse 11 being applied. These people are gathered as one mob because they have one Lord, Jesus, who has transferred and transformed them. Alike they were mired in sin, enemies of God. Alike they were dead in their sins with no hope. Alike Jesus lived and died and rose for them. Alike by faith his story is now their story. Alike they've been transferred and transformed. Alike they sit together as one mob and they are unique in the world. In the Jewish synagogue, women, men and children never sat together. Here they do. In no other setting in the ancient world did slaves and masters sit together as equals, and here they do. At no other point in other ancient household lists are husbands and wives regarded as equal in value, though different in role, and here they are. It's a unique community, unique in all time and history, 
in all geography. Moreover, and this is the sixth observation, when you consider the historical circumstances around this letter being written and delivered and read, then we have some colour and substance to those kinds of observations. When Onesimus is mentioned in Colossians chapter 4, verse 9, our minds are meant to be raised and pricked and alerted to the fact that this is the same Onesimus mentioned in Philemon, an escaped slave who became a Christian, described as a fellow faithful and loved brother of Paul and Timothy. The letters of Colossians and Philemon were hand-delivered by Tychicus and Onesimus to God's mob in Colossae. Can you get the picture in your head of God's mob gathered in one community for the church gathering? And Tychicus and Onesimus come in and deliver the letters and stand there and they're read as the escaped slave who's become a dearly beloved brother in Christ stands in the presence of his former master who has the right to have the death sentence committed upon him and they're connected by these truths of having the Lord Jesus making them one mob. We saw last year as we looked at Ephesians that these letters are truly radical in their context and in their application and in their vision of what it means to be God's mob. And some of this history helps us to gather that radical nature and to see how amazing it is to see that children sat in the meeting of the people of God and had commands read to them, to see that slaves and masters sat side by side as equals and husbands and wives were both regarded as equal value, bearing the image of God and different in their roles. What an amazing community gathered as God's mob. As we turn to these commands... Let me encourage you to think through how these six observations might encourage you as you read the Bible, in particular how you read the Bible. None of those observations that I've made are particularly deep nor necessarily obscure. They're really just a matter of reading the Bible, joining the dots quietly and thoughtfully. Let me encourage you to allow those six observations to help you think deeply about how you read the Bible as much as whether you read the Bible. Along similar lines, let me encourage you to think very hard and deeply about how such a reading helps us consider as God's people from the perspective of God's revelation, helps us consider the society and world we live in. Take the basic unit of society that's just been exposed here, the individual in community. Such a basic unit discovery can be used to examine and consider everything that exists in the world in front of us, from political parties and their philosophies to the way that protest movements demand change and demand a reworking of the way we live and exist, even through to how social media works and pandemics are dealt with, we could and we should thoughtfully consider everything we see in front of us in our world through the lens of the revelation of God and what it means to be God's people in this world. Let me encourage you to do that. Well, with those six observations in mind, and there's probably a fair bit there to chew over, isn't there? Uh, With those six observations in mind, let's turn to these commands that Paul and Timothy, or God through Paul and Timothy, lay out to individuals in community. I'm at point two on the outline. Look at verses 18 and 19. Wives, be submissive to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and don't become bitter against them. The commands given here right throughout this section are not complicated. The language is very clear. The words aren't debated or obscure. We don't have license to dismiss these commands by playing them off against other parts of the Bible like some people do with Colossians 3.11. Instead, Paul and Timothy, or God through Paul and Timothy, remarkably consistent here, matching what is said across a number of letters to a number of different communities at different times and in different contexts. 
the commands particularly given here to wives and husbands operate against the backdrop of both the fall, the way in which sin came into the world where we said, God, you are not and I am God in my attitude and action, the way in which that then broke the world and these relationships and the curse of God's judgment that it brought. Remember Genesis 3. These commands play off against that background of the fall and they also play off against the background of God working to restore the peace, the design, the goodness of that creation into his world under the lordship of Jesus. And so we need to read these commands as restoration commands, restoration of the peace of the Messiah that rules in our hearts, the goodness and the fullness of God's original desire being restored to this world through his people under the lordship of Jesus. Wives, that are to be submissive to your husbands. This is fitting in the Lord, a matter of both walking with Jesus as Lord as well as the restoration of God's design established in Genesis. It's worth noting here that the submission is to be to your husbands in that husband-wife relationship. It's worth remembering all that we learnt last year as we looked at the book of Ephesians and what that told us in Ephesians 5 about this relationship. The word submit is not a statement of value or worth. All humans are made in the image of God. It is a statement of role or order within God's design. It's a statement of role and order willingly entered into. It can be applied to someone like the one and only Son of God, as in Luke 2.51, he submits to his parents, people who are made in his image by him. A biblical submission then is not a statement about how worthwhile you are in God's image. It is a statement about his design and the order of his creation and the way in which this works best. It's a role that's willingly entered into in the order created by God. It's voluntarily entering into God's good design established in his creation And it's fitting, it's a statement that we walk with Jesus as Lord as he restores that peace to the world. Husbands are commanded to love your wives and don't become bitter against them. I think we struggle to grasp how revolutionary such a statement is, largely because we've marinated in the juices of our own culture for too long. There's no other household list in the ancient world that makes such a command to husbands. After all, in those household lists, wives were there because they were regarded as possessions and not image bearers of God. That's not the case here. Not the case in the peace of the Messiah, the restoration of God's good design. No, in God's mob, where individuals exist in community, Husbands are to treat their wives as equal image bearers of God and so to love them. And we've already seen what that love looks like, haven't we? Remember Colossians 3 verse 12 and Colossians 2 verse 13, where love is Jesus dying for his enemies who are dead in their sins so that they could be granted a forgiveness and life that they did not deserve so they could be transferred and transformed. God's people are transferred and transformed by such love and husbands are to display such love towards their wives. Moreover, as they enter into this relationship, they do so willingly, these men, as beneficiaries of God's grace, his undeserved generosity. This means that they too must display that to their wives. It's a mutually beneficial relationship of grace, not a millstone, not an inhibitor or a set of handcuffs or a limit on your nature as a human being or a bloke. As with other relationships, it's important to see here or right throughout this section that Paul and Timothy are not encouraging wives and husbands to make sure their spouses fulfil their responsibilities. They're to seek their own responsibilities. It's not a passage of rights where we say, I deserve to be submitted to God. I deserve to be loved. It's not a passage like that of those kind of rights, but it's a passage of responsibilities of individuals in community walking in the Lord. In each of our marriages, that will look different. 
After all, some of us have children, some of us have no children. Some are raising children, some have children raised. Some are working, some are retired. But let me ask wives and husbands three simple questions. Wives, how can you submit to your husband's leadership in a way that encourages him to lead the family in a walk that is fitting in the Lord? Husbands, how can you love your wives in a way that enables your marriage to display the self-sacrificial love that Jesus has for his mob? Together, as you live as individuals in community, how can you talk and live and walk in a way that holds God's design up as good and full rather than something to belittled, degraded and derided? Look at verses 20 to 21. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing in the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so they won't become discouraged. It's a great delight to read passages like this. Like we made the observation as we looked at Ephesians last year that children are addressed directly here. Say, kids, listen up. Kids, listen up. I'm not speaking to your parents here so that they can browbeat you with this information. I'm speaking to you. Paul and Timothy, God is speaking to you. This is a command to be heard directly by you children. And the command to you people is similar to the one given to wives, to mums. But you're commanded to obey your parents. Obedience is not optional. But let me say this very clearly, kids. Let me say this very clearly. Obedience does not mean that you should be allowed to be abused, neglected, or led into ungodliness. You ought to obey your parents because this will be pleasing in the Lord. Because as you obey them, you present a picture of what it means to have Jesus as your boss and how good God's design is when it's restored properly. Fathers. Well, really, parents, because the term used for fathers here is translated parents in Hebrews 11.23. So really we're dealing with parents. They're given a clear command. Don't exasperate your children. Well, the role of parents, as we heard in that reading from Deuteronomy 6, is to parent their children, little image bearers of God who've been entrusted to you, to parent their children so that the children meet God as he really is. Now, for God's mob now, that means introducing children to Jesus as we've experienced him, as the Lord of all things, as the one who has granted forgiveness to his enemies by grace, who's given life to the dead by grace, who's transferred and transformed people by grace. That's primarily the job of the parents. It's not a job to be outsourced to a youth group, to a Sunday school, even to a wider church community, although they all might play a role. It's primarily the job of the parents, and the currency of such a job, of such parenting, is grace. And grace never exasperates. Moreover, such parenting is to be in, done in such a way that children won't become discouraged. To put it bluntly, such parenting is pr- to present Jesus before children in such a way that they don't become discouraged by life, disheartened by a burden of legalism or an expectation of goodness that's unrealistic. Instead, they're delighted by the fact that they meet the greatness of the grace of Jesus in the way their parents love them, lead them, discipline them. So let me ask children and fathers' parents three simple questions. Hey, kids, how can you obey your parents today and tomorrow in a way that shows how good Jesus is? Fathers, parents, how can you parent your children in such a way that they are constantly confronted by grace, the same grace we've received from Jesus. And together, as children and parents, 
How can we live publicly and privately in such a way that we constantly draw attention to how good it is to live with God's design restored to its fullness? Well, look at verse 22. Slaves, obey your human masters in everything. Don't work only while being watched in order to please men, but work wholeheartedly fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do it enthusiastically as something done for the Lord, not for men, knowing that you'll receive the reward of an inheritance from the Lord. You serve the Lord Jesus Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for whatever wrong he's done, and there's no favoritism. Masters, supply your slaves with what is right and fair, since you know that you too have a master in heaven. Well, slavery has received much attention in passages like this and others within the New Testament, especially in the current protest climate. The immediate context, and this adds some significant feeling to the passage, is the picture we painted before of the conversion of Onesimus, a runaway slave. He's returned to Colossae to deliver this letter and Philemon, his former master, being there in the community of God's people listening. It's a remarkably poignant image and it happens against the backdrop of slavery as being a massive economic machine and engine for the Roman Empire. It's not necessarily the race-based slavery that we've experienced in our modern context, though that's part of it. Rather, it's actually a far more significant economic situation. Some people say that the majority of wage earners were slaves. So in that sense, it's much more akin to our work situation of employer and employee, but not completely equivalent. Within God's people, slaves were side by side in dignity and value, but they remained in an ordered economic relationship. They remained slaves. And so God, through Paul and Timothy, gives them two principles for their conduct. First, they are to fear the Lord and not men. And second, they must always remember who they serve in the long run. That will affect all that they do. And it will place all that they do and experience in the context of the lordship of Jesus and the consummation of his rule. The same applies applies for the masters who are listening. Those sitting here amongst God's mob must remember that they too have a master, the Lord, above all else. This Lord Jesus has treated them with a grace they don't merit or deserve and they must conduct themselves in the same way. And so the slave, the worker, must know by the conduct of the master that Jesus is his Lord. That means that as master, the same grace that they've experienced from Jesus must move through their work relationships. And again, like I have with the other two relationships, let me ask, Some simple questions. To the employees among us, how does your conduct at work reflect on the reputation and interests of Jesus as Lord in areas as diverse as your work ethic, your humour and your collegiality? To the employers among us, how does your employment practice care for your employees with grace in such a way that they meet the grace of the Lord Jesus in areas as diverse as work expectation through to how you deal with both mishap and success at work. Paul and Timothy have closed this section on applying the truth about who God's people are, what it looks like to live every day as God's mob, what it looks like to be an individual in community, They've closed it by looking at these basic units of society. At the heart of this application are two key principles. First, in Jesus as Lord, we have enough as God's people. He is sufficient. Through him, God has transferred and transformed us. He's done all this by the life, death and resurrection of Jesus for people who are dead in their sins, who were his enemies in such a way that connected to Jesus by trusting him, his story is now our story. And the second principle, with that identity established, God's people are exhorted to live as you are, displaying what God has already done for them in Jesus as a community, 
and as individuals in community. Boiled down to its simplest expression, this means walking with Jesus as Lord. So let's get walking as God's mob, as individuals in community. Let me pray. Father, thank you that through Jesus you have transferred and transformed us, that by faith his story is now our story and that you command us now to live as we are. Father, as a community of your people and as individuals in community, please so transform our walk daily that people will not only know who we are but more importantly who you are who the Lord Jesus is, and how sufficient he is for all of life. In his name we pray. Amen.